All right, my friends, we've now got our application up and running with Kubernetes, but there's one last thing I want to show you. Right now, we don't really have a good setup for running our code locally and doing local development with Kubernetes. Sure, we can deploy to our Minikube cluster, but going through the process of actually developing our application is a little bit awkward. Let me show you what I mean. If you recall back on the Docker Compose stuff we did, we had set up a client container for our React project. When we made use of Docker Compose, we set up a volume that mapped our local React project directory into that volume. So essentially, we were sharing our source code between our local file system and that client container. That meant that anytime we changed our code on our local machine, it updated the code inside the container as well, and the React application automatically updated right before our eyes. Now this system only works with Docker Compose right now. We don't really have anything equivalent for Kubernetes. So right now, if you and I wanted to make some change to our local React project during development, we don't have any easy way to somehow inject that source code into our client pod. Instead, we would have to completely rebuild the client image and then rerun that kubectl apply command. That's definitely a pain. So let me show you a better way to handle this development process. We're going to be making use of a tool called Scaffold. This is a command line tool separate from Kubernetes, but designed to be used with Kubernetes just to facilitate local development. Here's how Scaffold works. Scaffold is going to watch our local React project directory for changes. So you and I might then open up our code editor and change some React component or whatever else. Once we save that file, Scaffold is going to see that a change occurred, and then Scaffold is going to jump into action. Scaffold is all about somehow taking that change in our code and getting it reflected inside of our Kubernetes cluster. It can do that with one of two different modes, and we're going to explore both these different modes. The first way that Scaffold is going to somehow update our client pod inside of our cluster is just automatically rebuild the entire client image from scratch. When I say from scratch, I don't mean like re rerun every single step, including installing dependencies. It will be just a normal Docker build process. Scaffold is going to tell Docker to rebuild the client. Docker is going to see that the only change we made was to our source code. And so it's essentially just going to stick that source code into a new updated image. Scaffold will then take that image and update our local Kubernetes cluster. And then we should see our updated application appear. Now that process is still a little bit slow because we have to go through that entire sequence of rebuilding the image, even though it's kind of just the last step we are changing. And then we still have to go through that redeployment process. So the other way that Scaffold can work is mode two, which is to essentially take the updated files or the changes we made in our local React project directory and just kind of magically inject them into our client pod. It will then be up to our client pod to somehow automatically update itself. So with mode two right here, if we want to go with mode two, we need to make sure that our client pod is running in such a mode where it's going to see these updated files and automatically update itself. We've already set up create react app. Remember create react app is going to automatically refresh the change or excuse me, refresh the page anytime we change a file. We also set up our node project as well, the backend API server with nodemon. So nodemon watches for changes inside of our project directory. So right now our API server and the client pod will automatically refresh given this updated source code. So we currently have a project that's kind of well suited for mode number two. Okay, so now that we've got an overview of what Scaffold does, let's start to go through the installation process in the next video. In this video, we're going to install Scaffold onto our local machine. Now, the installation of Scaffold is gonna be very different depending upon the operating system you are running. You can find installation directions at this link right here, so scaffold.dev and so on. I'm gonna open up a new browser tab and navigate to that page. All right, so here's the Scaffold documentation for the getting started page right here. You can essentially ignore everything up at the top. We're really just gonna go straight down to installing Scaffold right here. So you'll see that there are installation directions for Linux, Mac, and Windows. Installation on Linux and Mac are gonna be pretty straightforward. So on Linux, just run those commands. That's pretty much it. On Mac OS, you can install Scaffold with Homebrew. I'm going to assume that if you've made it this far inside this course, you probably already have Homebrew installed. If you don't, and you try to run that command and see an error around don't know what brew is, then just make sure you go in and install Homebrew very quickly. Unfortunately, installation on Windows is a little bit more complicated. So this installation right here with Chocolatey, this is assuming that you have Chocolatey installed. 
That is a Python package manager for Windows. It's extremely possible that you might not have Chocolaty installed on a Windows machine unless you are 100% sure that you have gone through that installation process previously. So if you do not have Chocolaty installed, I recommend going with these other options, which is to download the binary and then add it to your path. To add something to a path on Windows, just do a quick Google search. It'll tell you exactly how to do this. Okay, so I'm using Mac OS. So I'm going to run that command right there, brew install scaffold. Over at my terminal, I'll do a brew install scaffold like so, and that's pretty much it. Now, I already have scaffold installed on my local machine, so I'm just going to see something that says, hey, you've already got this. All right, so once you get scaffold up and running, we'll take a quick pause, come back in the next video, and start making use of it inside of our project. Hopefully, you've now got scaffold installed on your local system. To make sure that everything is working correctly, you should be able to run scaffold version at the terminal and see a version print up like so. If you are running a version newer than me, that's totally fine. Scaffold has remained relatively unchanged over a pretty good amount of time. And to be honest, right before I record this video, I was actually running version 022. And I went through the process that we're about to go through for our application and everything still worked fine. So it's a relatively stable API. All right, so now that we've got Scaffold up and running, we're going to provide some configuration to Scaffold so that it knows how to handle our project. As you might guess, this is going to take the form of creating a YAML file. So here's my complex application open inside of my code editor. Inside of my root project directory, I'm going to create a very special file to configure how Scaffold works. So inside of my root project, I will create a file called scaffold.yaml, like so. So we're going to put together a YAML file very similar to many other that we've put together inside this course. This file in general is going to look a lot like a Docker Compose file, but with a couple extra settings here and there. I'm going to tell you about all the different important settings you need to be aware of, but if you want to, you can always go back over to the scaffold page, check out concepts, tutorials, and references. And if you look at references in particular, there's a section on scaffold.yaml, and it's essentially a annotated YAML file that will appear, and it will tell you about the meaning of all the different options we can set. It looks like my browser is having a little bit of trouble actually. Oh, okay, there it is finally. Just going a little bit slow here. Eventually, I will see a big list of all the different... Ah, there we go, finally. So here's all the different configuration options we can provide, but I'm going to tell you all the different options you need to be aware of. All right, so back inside my code editor, we're going to first start off with a little bit of boilerplate. So I'll say API version scaffold slash v1 beta 2, like so. Notice the capital V on here. As usual, inside of our YAML file, if you make any typo inside of here, stuff is not going to work as expected. Next up, we're going to specify, specify a kind of config with a capital C like so. And then here's where things finally get interesting. We're going to specify a section called build. So inside of build, we're going to essentially list out all the different images or different deployments that we want Scaffold to manage. Inside the build section, the first option we're going to specify is something called local. And then inside there, we'll do a push of false. So by default, Scaffold, whenever it builds an image, is going to try to push the built image off to, say, Docker Hub or whatever your default Docker repository is. For local development, it's extremely likely that you probably don't want to push these images off to some hub or repository, you probably just want to make a change on your local machine and test it out yourself. So you're almost always, in my opinion, you might have a very different workflow. You're very likely going to have local push false, which just means every time that Scaffold builds an image, we're not going to do that push. All right, so next up, we're going to define a new image or a new container that we want Scaffold to manage. Scaffold refers to these as artifacts. So we'll define artifacts like so. And this is going to be an array of different images or essentially containers we want Scaffold to manage. So I'm going to put in that little dash right there. Remember, in YAML, that indicates an array. I'll then provide the name of the first image that I want Scaffold to manage. So for me, it's going to be Steven Greider slash multi-client like so. After that, we're going to specify the folder where we are building this image from. So for you and me, it's going to be the client directory. So I will say context is client. 
Remember, context in the world of Docker usually refers to as a refers to a folder or something like that. After that, we are going to tell Scaffold exactly what Docker file we wanted to use when building our client image. So for you and me, it's going to be that dockerfile.dev file right here. Remember, that is the Docker file we use when we're trying to run our React application in a development mode. So I will say docker, docker file, docker file dot dev. Okay. And then finally, this is the really meaningful option. Remember, I just told you that scaffold operates in two separate modes. It has mode one, where anytime it detects a change, it's going to attempt to rebuild the entire image from scratch. And with mode two, it's going to just try to take updated files and eject them into the client pod. So in the case of our multi-client application, we want to use mode number two, because our client pod, our React application, is set up to automatically see changes to files and update itself. So in order to tell Scaffold to use mode number two, we're going to set another property here called sync. Sync is going to be a listing right here, so a couple of key value pairs. We're going to provide file paths right here that can be kind of glob matchers. And this is going to tell what files we want Scaffold to use when attempting to use mode number two. So in our case, we're going to put in here star star slash star dot JS dot like so. So this right here essentially means anytime Scaffold sees a JavaScript file change, just take that JavaScript file and throw it into the container. We're going to do that same thing for CSS and HTML files as well. So once again, this section right here is essentially what enables mode two of scaffold. Anytime it sees a change to a JavaScript file, a CSS file, or an HTML file, take that updated file and just inject it into our running pod or container in this case. Okay, so that's kind of part one of our scaffold.yaml file. Right now we are telling Scaffold only to manage our multi-client image, but eventually we will also add in some instructions on how Scaffold should manage, say, our API server and the worker as well. All right, so I'm gonna save this file right here. We're gonna take a quick pause. And when we come back, we're gonna finish off a little bit more config inside this file. In the last video, we started working on our Scaffold config file. So we've added in an artifact here. Remember that is telling Scaffold that we wanted to manage our client project. All right, so now the next thing we're going to do is go down to the very base layer of indentation here. So notice how I'm all the way back out. And we're going to set up a section called deploy. We're going to pass in a couple nested properties here. So we're going to say deploy, kubectl, manifest, and then we're going to list out all the different config files that we want Scaffold to manage for us. When I say config files, I'm talking about Kubernetes YAML files. So essentially in this case, we're going to attempt to tell Scaffold that we wanted to manage our multi-client deployment using the client-deployment YAML file. So as an array entry right here, I'll say k 8 slash client-deployment.yaml. All right, and that's pretty much it. So now anytime we start up Scaffold, it's going to attempt to apply that config file to our Kubernetes cluster. Scaffold simultaneously is going to start watching our client project directory for changes. If we make any changes to a JavaScript file, CSS, or HTML, it's going to inject those changed files into our multi-client pod or container. One quick thing I want to mention is that if we make any changes to a file besides a JavaScript, CSS, or HTML file, then Scaffold is going to fall back to mode one. So if we change anything besides CSS, HTML, or JavaScript, it's going to fall back to just rebuilding that client image from scratch and using it to update our Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so that's it for our config for just the client deployment. So I'm now going to save this file, then we will do a quick test. So I'm going to flip back over to my terminal. Inside of my complex project directory, I'm going to start up scaffold by running scaffold dev, like so. All right, there we go. So you're going to see that Scaffold's going to immediately try to build our client image. It's then going to take that built image and throw it into our Kubernetes cluster. So you can see that it created that client deployment right here. We'll then start to see some logs coming out of that client image that Scaffold is now, 
or excuse me, client container that Scaffold is now managing. Let me zoom out here just so we can see those logs more easily. And so we can see the message that the React application has started up successfully in development mode. We're seeing all this output three times because remember our deployment file specifies that we should run three instances of the client pod. So now we can flip back over to our browser and test this out. I'm going to go to k8smulti.com. Remember that is the host alias I set up on my local machine and I'll see the app appear. Now we already really had our application appearing. So what's different here? Well, remember, anytime we now change a project file, we should automatically see our React application get the update. So to test that out, I'll go back over to my code editor. In my client directory, I'll find the SRC folder. And then inside there, I'll find the app.js file. Remember inside of here is that h1 tag that has that big header at the top. So I'll just make some change to that text. I'll say like, updated. So fib calculator updated. So I can now save this file. As soon as I do, I'm going to change back over to my terminal, and we're going to see how Scaffold responds to that. So right here, it says syncing one file for Steven Greider multi-client. So Scaffold has seen that I changed the JavaScript file. It's going to take that file and try to inject it into that multi-client image container. And we can then see some update messages right here from those three separate pods that are running multi-client telling us, hey, all right, we got that update successfully. The compiled successfully message is coming from create react app. So this is essentially create react app saying, hey, we see a change to a file. We're going to try to rebuild our client project. When I say client plot project, I'm talking about like our client JavaScript code, not rebuilding an image or anything like that. So if I now flip back over to my browser, I'll see updated appear. If you do not see the live update right here, it's totally fine. I have noticed that scaffold with injecting stuff is sometimes a little bit finicky you will just about always see the files injected into the container. Maybe it's not scaffold that's finicky, but rather create react app is. So sometimes create react app will not automatically update the page. If it doesn't just do a manual refresh and you should then see the update up here. Okay. So clearly we made a change and we did not have to rebuild an image manually or anything like that. We just saw the change up here. So as you might guess, this is an amazing tool for local development with Kubernetes. And there's still a couple more things I want to tell you about Scaffold. So let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next video. In this video, there's a couple odds and ends I want to mention around Scaffold. So you'll notice that down here at the very bottom of the config file, we added in this manifest section and we provided a path to just that client deployment YAML file. So by adding in this YAML file right here, anytime we start up Scaffold with Scaffold dev at our terminal, Scaffold will automatically try to apply that YAML config file to our Kubernetes cluster. Now here's the important part. Anytime we close down Scaffold, Scaffold will immediately try to delete the deployment that we created with that fi file as well. So take a look at this. If I flip back over to my browser, excuse me, my terminal, and I hit Control C, we're going to automatically see deployment apps, client deployment deleted right here. If I now attempt to get my pods, I'll see that all of my client pods have been deleted automatically. So this is another feature of Scaffold that's really nice. Right now, anytime you do some local Kubernetes development, if you decide to like pause working on one project and start working on another, you might have a ton of different containers or pods in the same namesp namespace, and it's kind of hard to tell which is which. So by using Scaffold, you can automatically set startup one set of different pods and then automatically close them all down as soon as you stop Scaffold as well. At present, we are not having our server deployment being managed or our worker deployment being managed by Scaffold. So if you wanted to make sure that those pods also started up and got shut down automatically, we could add them to that manifest section. Let's do that right now. So back over here, I can add in K8s. And we're going to go for our server deployment. And we can also do our K8s worker deployment as well. We are not limited just to having deployments being managed by scaffold. We can also add in services as well. So if we wanted to make sure that we also say shut down the server cluster IP service, we can just add that as an additional entry. So I can do server cluster IP service dot EML like so. And the same thing for let's add, just go ahead and be complete here. 
I'll add in also my client cluster IP service and the worker, excuse me, our worker doesn't have one. So we'll just do just server and client. All right, so I can now save this file, pull it back over to my terminal. I can start everything up with a scaffold dev. So we'll see that scaffold has automatically applied all those different config files. Our React application is going to start up. And then at any point in time, we can hit Control C, and we'll see that Scaffold's going to shut down all of our client pods, all the server pods, and the worker pod as well. So I'll do that right now. I'll hit Control C. That's going to delete all those pods. And now if I get my pods, yep, I will see that the server deployment, while it's still listed, it is being terminated along with the worker as well. So if I run that again right now, yeah, there we go. Now the server and the workers are completely gone. And there is kind of one downside to this entire approach of adding in all these different services or manifests into this scaffold file right here. Because remember, we're now saying that as soon as we close down scaffold, we're going to essentially delete all the things we have listed here. So the downside to that is that if you have anything persistent, like maybe a database or a volume that you want to keep around for development purposes, because maybe you've got a lot of test data loaded on there or something like that, do not add those things into your scaffold file. Because if you have any persistent data in the form of volumes or pods or whatever else, scaffold is gonna delete that stuff as soon as you close it down. So I would recommend not adding those things to your scaffold file. And you can actually see in my development, excuse me, my environment right here, I actually have a Postgres deployment that's been running for 110 days. So that's for a very different project that I've been working on for quite a while. I don't want that deployment for Postgres to be managed by Scaffold because I have some persistent test data in there and I don't want to have to be recreating that database and reseeding that database with all that test data every single time I decide to go back and start using Scaffold on it again. So in the case of all your different pods for running React applications or APIs or kind of these stateless services, no problem adding them to the Scaffold file. But for anything related to data, you might not want to add it in because like I said, Scaffold is just going to very quickly delete it. All right, so now that we understand a lot more about Scaffold, I want to add in all of our different services or deployments to this thing so that we can get some live updates on our server and our worker and all that good stuff as well. So let's take a quick pause. When we come back, we'll just add in some more configuration for artifacts for both the worker and the server. So I'll see you in just a minute. In this video, we're going to add in some artifact sections for our worker and our server so we can get some automatic code reload with those two things as well. So inside of my scaffold dev file, I'm going to find my artifact section and I'll add in another array entry. As usual, please make sure that you've got that dash on the same tab line as the one right above it. If you indent that thing, you're going to very quickly see an error message. All right, so we'll add in an artifact section for how about our server first. So I'll first specify my, my image, which is going to have a name for me of Steven Greider multi-server, I think is what we called it. I'm just going to do a quick check here. Here's my server deployment, called it multi-server. Okay, very good. I'll then specify the context, which is essentially just the directory for that. So in this case, server. I'll then specify the Docker file that I want to use, which is going to be dockerfile.dev. And then we can list out all the different things that we want to have synced. So in this case, we're not going to have any CSS or HTML files. We really just have JavaScript files inside of our server. So I'll do star 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 JS colon dot like so. Now we can repeat that same process for worker as well. So I'll once again, add in a dash image of Steven writer, multi worker. The context is the worker directory. For Docker, we want to tell it to use the Docker file of dockerfile.dev. And once again, we only really want to sync star 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 js like so. Now I want to repeat one more time because this is a little tricky thing. The only time that you're going to want this to use this mode two method of syncing files is when your different sub projects have some ability to detect changes and automatically reload themselves. So we built that into our server and our worker projects as well. Remember the Docker file dev for each of those starts up those projects using the dev script. 
and that dev script runs nodemon, which watches for changes in the local project directory, in this case inside the container, and automatically restarts the project. So if our sub-projects here of server and worker do not make use of newly synced files coming in from scaffold, then it's pointless to try to use scaffold to sync those files. Instead, if we don't have that ability, we would want scaffold to operate in mode one, which is to say, automatically rebuild the entire image anytime we make a change. All right, so now that we've added those in, let's do a quick test. So I'm gonna flip back over to my terminal. I'll do a scaffold dev once again. And now we're going to see that we are building those three separate images. Those things all got deployed. We'll see some startup information here really quickly. There's the server running Nodemon. We probably can also see the worker inside of here as well. It looks like my server has an error around connecting to Postgres. That's totally fine, kind of outside the realm of what we're doing right now. And eventually it looks like everything is started up. So I'm gonna very quickly test this inside of my browser. I'll do a refresh here and yep, I still got this running. So now let's try making a change to our server project and just make sure that the files get synced and that the server automatically restarts. So for that, I'll find my server index.js file. And to test out a change, maybe let's try to like hard code some value that we're sending back. So right now, notice how values all. Remember, we're trying to get that information coming from Postgres. So rather than sending back some information coming from Postgres, I'm going to instead comment out the values line and then send back some hard-coded values. So I'll just say, always send one, two, three, like so. Again, I'm just doing this to have some change that we can actually detect inside of our application. So I'll now save this file. If I flip back over to my terminal, I'll see that Scaffold has seen that we made a change and synced that file. And then we can see that Nodemon inside of our server pods has automatically restarted. So now we can flip back over to our browser, do a refresh, and I'll see, okay, I probably put in the incorrect format of data. I think that's probably supposed to be an array of arrays. So my mistake there. However, if we open up our network request log and we look at all, we will see that we did receive an array of one, two, three. So we definitely successfully saw that change sync to our server and the server automatically restarted. All right, so now last thing we can do once we're all done with development, we can stop scaffold by hitting control C. And all those different deployments and services, everything automatically get cleaned up after us. All right, so that's it. That's pretty much Scaffold in a nutshell. Personally, I use Scaffold on every Kubernetes project I work on because it makes it incredibly simple to, first off, work on different projects on your local machine. And it also makes it really easy and straightforward to do local development environments. So like work on a React application or an API without having to constantly rebuild all these images and manually redeploy them every time as well. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this and we'll take a pause right here. And that's pretty much it for now. So I'll catch you later.